Hello, I'm Otis Corbett. And today I want to share a word about the mantle of leadership as I comment on 1 Kings 19, verses 15 and 16, and verses 19 through 21. Now, if you think that you have tuned into last week's edition because the scriptures are the same, let me put your mind at rest. We will be looking at the same passage of scripture, but from a different perspective. This passage reads, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazal as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel-Mahola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them using the equipment from the oxen. He boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now, when we reviewed this passage last week, we highlighted the need to intentionally multiply ourselves through investing in others. And that's exactly what Paul taught in 2 Timothy 2.2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So, we can see that both the Old Testament and the New Testament instruct us to find the leaders whom God will use to lead His people when we are long gone. And remember, none of us will live forever. We need to be like Elijah and be sensitive to God's leading. And we also need to be like Elijah and obey God when He leads. Also, when the mantle is passed to us, we need to be like Elisha and receive it with wholehearted obedience. And that's something that we want to look at together today. Now, right from the top, we can see that God's call to leadership is usually, if not always, unexpected. And that's exactly the case here with Elisha. Now, Elisha was occupied. He was plowing a field. He was taking care of his family's business. And he also had his hands full as well. I, I've never tried to control 24 oxen, and I really don't want to ever try. Now, the point to observe here is that when God's call comes, it doesn't come when we're ready. No, God's call comes when He is ready. The saying that God doesn't call the equipped, but He equips the called surely applies here. In fact, that seems to be a constant principle in the history of God's leadership of His people. For example, Moses was not called to leadership when he was a prince of Egypt, but when he was a shepherd on the backside of the desert. Samuel was called while he was in service to the high priest, and David was tending sheep. Nehemiah was a servant to a foreign king in exile, as was Daniel. Peter, James, and John were fishing, and Matthew was collecting taxes. Saul was on the way to persecute the church. Now, none of these were sitting around idly twiddling their thumbs. All of them had things to do, places to be, and people to see. Yet God in His sovereignty looked down from heaven and said, That's the one, that one, that one right there. He's the one that I want. So the same thing still happens today, and so don't be surprised if it happens to you or to someone whom you love. Another thing to observe is that when God is ready, He expects us to be ready too. Elisha was surprised at his call, and he was conflicted as well. You see, God's call meant he had to leave behind everything that he'd ever known and everyone whom he ever knew. 
In Old Testament Israel, family literally meant everything. The leadership structure of the nation was through tribes, which were extended families. Children were taught by their parents, and they worked on the family farm or in their family business or in their family shop. Even worship in the temple was led by priests and Levites who were following in their father's footsteps. Family was a big deal. So Elisha asked Elijah for permission to go say goodbye to his parents. Now this is a natural human response, and a culturally appropriate one to be sure, but it wasn't what God desired. Elijah's literal response to this was, Go back again, for what have I done to you? Now we can probably interpret that to mean, Your obedience is between you and God. I didn't call you, He did. And you have to deal with that yourself. This is just like the man in Luke chapter 9 who asks Jesus for permission to bury his father before following him. Jesus simply told him, let the dead bury the dead. In that same passage, another would-be follower of Jesus wanted to tell his parents goodbye, just like Elisha. And Jesus told him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When God wants us, he wants us on his schedule, not our schedule. Now, while some in the Bible tried to delay, others responded immediately. When God called Abram, he packed up everything and he followed God to a place that God would show him later. Moses yielded to God at the burning bush, and the disciples left their nets and their boats and followed Jesus. In Philippi, not only was Lydia and her whole family baptized as soon as the, they realized the truth of the gospel, so was the jailer and his whole family as well. Now, Elisha responded to God's call, and he didn't go bid farewell to his family. He did have something he needed to do, however, and that was to make a sacrifice of a yoke of oxen. Now, while it is possible that he sacrificed all 24 oxen, I think he really only sacrificed the last pair. But that was a tremendous sacrifice nonetheless. His actions remind me of an old joke. and It's a bad joke, but it's one I enjoy. It goes like this. The barnyard animals all loved the farmer and wanted to do something special for him on his birthday. The cow had an idea and said, I know, let's serve him breakfast in bed. We can prepare bacon and eggs and I'll give him a glass of warm, fresh milk. Now, the chickens enthusiastically clucked their approval, but the pig quickly objected, protesting. Now, wait just a minute. For you guys, milk and eggs are offerings. But for me, bacon is a real sacrifice. Now, there's no doubt that leadership is sacrifice. Leaders are first in and they're last out. And in the church, a leader's responsibility extends past the workday and past the work week. Jeremiah the prophet recognized that leader was sacrifice, as did Paul, who described his experiences of serving God in this way. Five times I received from the Jews forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in the danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, some would, when confronted with these prospects or like the students in a class who look down at their desk hoping that the teacher won't call on them. That's probably what Saul was doing, standing at the back of his family when Samuel came to anoint him king of Israel. But thankfully, there are others like Isaiah who proclaim boldly, Here I am, Lord, send me. And was Elisha bold or what? His ministry was the very definition of go big or go home. And nothing makes a statement like sacrificing a couple of oxen and feeding the neighborhood. 
<laughs> now, the fact that he made stew instead of a barbecue might even indicate that he was in a hurry to catch up with Elijah. As we have looked at Elijah and Elisha in this passage of Scripture, we've seen men who were sold out to serve God. Like Jesus, Elijah did not see his status as prophet in Israel as something to be grasped. But when God told him it was time, he let go of his position and he called out his replacement. Elisha, knowing the awesome task that was being placed before him, made a public commitment to serving his Lord. Like the Spanish explorer Cortez, he burned his ships and he didn't look back. These men and other people like them in the Bible are truly models for us to follow as we multiply leaders and we take up the mantle of leadership ourselves. So what about us? Are we ready to burn our ships? Are we ready to follow God regardless of the cost? Can we say with certainty, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Such commitment is a sacrifice, but it's one that God will honor and one that He will use as we follow Him into leadership. Before I go, let me share my new book with you. Seminary taught me to be a pastor, but the Army taught me to be a leader. I would like to share how God melded those two skill sets in my new book, Decently and in Order. It's available now on Amazon in paperback and on Kindle. If you want to know more about effectively leading teams and events, check out Decently and in Order on Amazon.com. I believe you will find it eye-opening and helpful. That's Decently and in Order by Otis Corbett. Thanks for taking a look. Thanks for watching. I'll be back soon with another word from the Bible we can share together. Every blessing, I'm Dr. Otis Corbett.